day for Wednesday, February the 6th, 2019. The show title is Open Phone, and this is where Mr. Fuller will answer your questions in a counter-racist compensatory fashion. Keep that in mind, counter-racist compensatory fashion. He will answer your questions, so make sure your questions are in that mode. Many of you do not do that, maybe because you're not conscious of the fact that we are in a global prison system of the only government upon the face of the earth, which is the government of white supremacy. If you'd like to join the conversation, you can by calling one 932 9766 You can also go to the YouTube channel, type in the word Talktainment, and then there'll be a little space where you can type in the word radio and then scroll down to a, a place where you can type in Talktainment number two. And then when you do that, you can also hit the subscribe and like button. Uh, we would like for you to go to the TalkTainmentRadio.com homepage, and all you have to do is click Listen Live, and you're right there. Subscribe and uh, hit the like button there. And if you do have any questions, you can go to the numero 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y, at gmail.com, and we will try to get to your answers. And one more thing, if you would like to hear the program in its entirety, we also offer it on facebook.com forward slash talktainment. Okay, with all that out of the way, don't forget to make your donations to the program for the second hour. We like to present to some, and and uh, well, I forgot the word. Present to some and introduce to others Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Mr. Fuller, since this morning here on the eastern part of the United States, we'd like to say good morning to you. Good morning. And as we, as is, as is our custom, how are you this day? I'm still learning. You are still learning. Good. Um, last week, I'll get my notes here. We ended up the program with a uh, question. Uh, that we said that we would um, get back to, and um, I tell you what, before we get to the to the question, let's take this particular phone call. Uh, caller, uh, you're going to be on with Mr. Fuller right now, so go ahead with your question. Hello, yes. How you doing this morning, Mr. Fuller? Still learning. Yes, I am too as well. Uh, thanks for taking my call. My call will be in this political uh, election just now coming up. If you are asked to help develop what will be considered a black agenda, I know I've heard you say oftentimes black people should just ask for justice, uh, but if you would get a little more specific, what would be something good that we can specifically ask just for black people for anybody uh, that's looked to be running for uh, candidacy and seeking the black vote. Just make up a list of all the things that you think you should have and try to, and then double check that list to make sure that everything on that list would produce a constructive result. In other words, don't be too abstract. Try to be very specific about just thinking about the things that you want, but make sure that the things that you want will produce a constructive result, not just the latest fashions of what everybody's doing and say, well, I, I, I'd like to have this and that and the other. Uh, so lots of things that's off the top of your head you might say that you want, but a lot of it is just a whole lot of clutter in your existence. So the main Could you give thing, an example? Could you give us an example of something specific? Oh, sure. I mean, you want you want the schools to improve to start with. I mean, uh, you have offspring or you have cousins or br brothers. Uh, some of them are going to be going to school or you need to go to school yourself. You need to be educated in all the things that would help you to do constructive things. That's, that's, that, that is very fundamental. I mean, if you don't have that, everything is going to fall apart anyway. You can get a whole lot of this and a whole lot of that and be offered a lot of this 
and run it all over the place, maybe for the next 10, 15 years. But if you don't have a focus for what you're doing that comes through a constructive education, meaning learning what's important and what is not, that's an education education within itself. Just learning the difference between what is important and what isn't, and then try to learn something about everything that has constructive value and throw the rest of it in the trash can because there's a lot of things that are being taught through the social media and everything else that is doing nothing but getting in your way and ruining your entire existence. And black people are kind of known all over the world for people who don't have any kind of focus. Their minds are just all over the place. And when they do have a focus, it's usually gravitating toward anything, a, a lot of things that are total nonsense. And the white supremacists always want to load up black people's minds with things that don't make sense. We get up in the morning, go to bed at night with all type of, you might say, uh, social and material garbage in our minds because everything starts with the mind. So you just want to just have a house cleaning in your mind to start with. And so the things that you ask for should be very specific, like you are saying, about the things that you want that will produce constructive results. And you have to make up your own mind about that. But I just said education is one. Education about what? Those things that will have the most productive results. Not a whole bunch of foolishness. Mm -hmm. I okay. mean, you can get that free. Okay. That goes along with the, with the four questions. What do you want? Why do you want it? How do you want it? And the What do you want? That's right. Why do you want it? How do you plan to get it? And what do you expect the constructive result to be? Okay. All righty. Uh, caller uh, on line number one, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Uh, good morning, Mr. Bobby, and good morning, Mr. Fuller. Uh, I have a question, and then I have a comment, and uh, I want to uh, put it in a question form for Mr. Fuller. Mr. Fuller, I've been paying attention to the news. I've been reading uh, more newspapers, and it seems as if black people are just extremely confused about the system of white supremacy. And I know I've heard you speak many, many times on how black people have the ability to be constructive, but we just for some reason have a very, very hard time in doing so. My question is very simple, but I think it will be constructive, is why is black dysfunction and confusion essential to maintaining white supremacy? And why are we as black people so dysfunctional and so confused about solving this problem? It's because we are, <clears throat> we are loaded up with clutter. The white supremacists walk down a line, of, you might say, just, just go down a road and just pick up every piece of garbage that's alongside that road. Everything has been discarded. Everything is almost completely worthless. I mean, this piece of trash, that old bottle, that old tire, and it could just come and dump it on black people. Now, that, that's, that's just a metaphor for the way that they do it. And they dump it in white, uh, black people's minds. And so our minds are just full of garbage. I mean, we wake up in the morning and go to bed at night. We are known to be garbage people in our minds, not people who do janitorial services. That's, that's not a disgrace. I mean, that's keeping the house clean and all this type of thing, or clean, keeping a city clean or a town and whatnot. There's no disgrace in that at all. But, I mean, our minds are full of foolishness. I mean, we worship foolishness. We gravitate toward foolishness because we have been trained that way. The white supremacists do not want around any black people who on their own think about doing anything of constructive value. I mean, our conversations are full of nonsense, uh, so so much nonsense that the clutter itself starts, we start tripping over it, and the next thing you know, we're even doing what is the result of a whole bunch of garbage and, and, and 
and nonsense environment that we start turning on each other. Uh, I heard someone in the grocery and uh, just yesterday saying, what is wrong with black people? It's a, you know, it seems like, man, we don't ever do anything that makes sense. I mean, we're always trying to undermine each other. That's what one black person behind me in a grocery line was talk, saying to another black person. And I was listening to it. I didn't make any comment. But that is correct. And we all know that. And it's a reason for it. It's because the white supremacists gravitate us toward that. And we've gotten to the place we love garbage. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we invented that term, I think. I think we invented it, talking trash. Mm, yeah. See, we trash talk all day long. I mean, and so much so that the average white person coming around a black person or even just getting on the elevator, they want to get off that elevator as fast as they can. They get away from black people. Why? Because we are poisonous. I mean, if we say anything, I mean, it, it, it's going to be, you know, three or four sentences we might make sense. And then it's going to lapse right into a whole bunch of nothing that nobody wants to hear that's got any sense. Our conversations consist of nothing that anybody with any sense would ever want to hear anywhere. Hmm. Yes. If we stop and uh, think about it and tell the truth. But we're not that way. We weren't born that way. We got that way by the white supremacist that says, oh, Garbage is black culture. I mean, black culture consists of piles and piles and piles and piles of throwaway material. Hmm. And they become throwaway people, which is what we want them to be. Mm -hmm. And what I was mean, your people second? People can just scoop up and just throw in the garbage pit because their minds are full of garbage, their bodies are full of garbage, the food that they choose to eat is all garbage. And they worship it. They pick out, you know, because we feed it to them. We tell them that's the thing to buy, a whole bunch of what we call junk food. And they love it. We want them to love it. And we want them to be throwaway people. Why? We can use them. That's why. Hmm. Yes. Right? And they can prop up the system of white supremacy forever. What was your second question, sir? Uh, my, thank you, Mr. Bobby. I appreciate that. Uh, my second question was I was making an observation uh, in the code book and, uh, many times on this previous broadcast that Mr. Fuller has done. He has often cited that the highest level of terrorism and confusion that a suspected white supremacist can do to a black person is engage in a sexual relationship with that person. And I was having a conversation yesterday with a victim of racism, a black female, who was having trouble with her teenage son. And we were just having a conversation about um, to make some constructive uh, changes in her life and things of that nature. And I, I just thought about Mr. Fuller immediately, and I wanted to get his comments. She said to me, well, one of the things that she was mad about with her teenage son was that her two black brothers were not being a strong role model to her mixed-race son. And I said to her, isn't your mixed-race son looking for leadership from his father. And she just looked at me, and I thought about Mr. Fuller. She has BGQ, but that is the highest form of terrorism that you can do because that child is now confused because the black woman is looking for leadership from a black person, but she essentially chose a suspected racist to be the father of her child. And I just wanted to get Mr. Fuller's, um, you know, his commentary on why that level of confusion is so harmful to black people. All right. Thank you for your call. Mr. Fuller? Well, everything that the white supremacists do with non-white people is to spread confusion. That's everything. I don't care how it looks on the surface. Because once you can confuse people, you can what? You can always dominate them. Dominate them, yes. Mm -hmm. You can always dominate a person that you that is confused. If you are not confused and that person standing next to you is confused, you can dominate that person. And if, as long as you can keep them confused, you can dominate that person forever. Yes, you sir. can use them for whatever you want to use them for. Why? Because they are confused and you are not. That's just the law of the universe. 
So the white supremacists, when they come around non-white people, first thing they first order of business is to confuse them, to make them think that one thing is not what it is, to, to turn everything around, turn everything inside out, mm-hmm. upside down, mm-hmm. just anything that will cause confusion. And then the more confusion they cause, it's easier to control any number of people, not just one person. You can control millions of people. Just one person can control millions of people. If you can keep those millions confused, have them believe things that are not true. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Makes me think of this, the Temptation song, Ball of Confusion. TalkTainmentRadio.com is a 24-7, no-charge, worldwide broadcasting facility with hosts delivering on various topics such as news and lifestyle, sports law, sports law, health, wellness, religion, and politics. Now, here's three that I am going to share with you. Uh, the Voice of the Pink Pearl. It's your time to travel. And, of course, this show, The Compensatory Concept, with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Now, all these shows are exclusive to TalkTainmentRadio.com, and all you have to do is go to the TalkTainmentRadio.com homepage, and right in front of you there will be a screen, and there's a little bar that says Programs. All you have to do is click on Programs, and there will be a number of programs there that you can view and take in and see if, you know what they have to say. It's good for you. All that, all you do is go to TalkTainmentRadio.com, click on Programs for the scheduled times. TalkTainmentRadio.com. That is radio, the way it should be heard. My name is Mr. Bobby. I am the co-host of The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. And today's topic is open phone, which means that you can call in and you may ask Mr. Fuller your question. And keep in mind that all of his responses or suggestions will be in the compensatory counter races logic. you got to keep that in mind. I think the last caller was wondering why we get off track I think it's because we don't stay focused that we are in a prison, but be that as it may. But make sure that when you ask that question that you keep that that thought in mind. And with that in mind, let's go to last week's uh, call that we ended the show on. You were going to make a comment on that, Mr. Fuller, but I'll read it again. This comes from GG8, and that's not how they pronounce their their name. But uh, anyway, GG8. It says, please ask Mr. Fuller whether his plan for the breaking down of white supremacy racism based on Plato's definition of human freedom, which accordingly can only be realized when man is totally, quote, rational. That is when reason rules passion. Uh, Mr. Fuller, that is the exact question, the way it was asked. Uh, what say you as your suggestion to that question? Well, I've never really understood uh, uh, the different ways that the word rational is used. Uh, when I first heard that and read that years ago, the word rational, you mean r- ration? What? I- I've never, I- I've looked it up, but I still, it's too abstract to mm-hmm. me, the word mm-hmm. rational. So that would seem to be the goal to be rational of Mr. Plato, but I never really understood that. So, you know, I, I, I just kind of dismissed it, really, if I remember. I've, I've read some of Plato's writings, and I never, I don't remember reading that one. But if he said the goal is to be rational, you know, what, what does that mean? Yes. Uh, words should be kind of specific. I try to make my words as specific as I possibly can. Uh, but I, I've never really understood what people mean when people say, you know, in general conversation, people will say, well, you got to be more rational. More rational? Yeah. Okay, by doing what? See, I always want to get to the doing part. Yes, sir. And uh, so I don't really know how to deal with that word rational by Plato. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, what do you so mean? Maybe some that? professor or somebody else can say exactly what that means in practical terms, mm-hmm. and then I'll grasp it. So that's what I want to know. I want to know about the doing part. 
you know, mm-hmm. but then be the, rational by doing what? By doing what? And you Under just what mentioned circumstance. Give me some examples. Yes. All right. Right. And then you just mentioned the word practical, so I can see someone asking the question, well, what does practical mean? Yes, what does practical mean? Being practical about what? Yes. I mean, you know, you can be practical about a lot of things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. how, when, under what circumstances, yeah. in order to achieve what? I mean, practicality. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six, or you can Gmail me at the numeral 7 Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y at gmail.com. Uh, the topic today is really an open phone, which Mr. Fuller will answer or su- make suggestions to whatever questions that you may have. And going to the uh, Gmail here, uh, this comes from the GMX. says, uh, good morning, Mr. Fuller. Mr. Fuller once said that we should ask for any white person with the same family name like us for some help. Now, he re- he referenced page 95, I'm going to assume, which is a bad word, that he meant the uh, contemporary counter-racist uh, code. But uh, anyway, we'll get to that. He said, I also heard that he wished he found someone called Fuller for some help. The question is, did Mr. Fuller ever, I'm going to read it just the way they said it, did Mr. Fuller ever heard about Mr. Buckmaster Fuller? 1895 to 1983. Mr. Buckmaster Fuller was known to be a problem solver and an architect. He wrote a book called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, and its purpose was to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. What a similarity. Mr. Fuller's code could be translated like in, quote, in order to be universal man and universal woman in the shortest time through the process of question and answer with the will to produce correctness and justice. Can Mr. Fuller, can Mr. Fuller please react on this? Thank you. Well, I think that's Buck Minister Fuller. Let me see. Yes, Buckminster Fuller. Yeah, Buckminster Fuller. I never tried to get in contact with him uh, for a simple reason. Uh, I don't think that, you know, particularly when I started talking to him, he would want to talk to me. I just assumed that. And uh, I was just talking about people that you work around every day. I wasn't talking about someone who was very prominent like Mr. Buckminster Fuller because I, I tend not to believe that I could just pick up the phone and call, say, uh, the president, uh, Donald Trump, and ask for an audience with him right now. Drop what he's doing and talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I just kind of assumed it would probably be the same thing (laughs) with Mr. Buck, Minister Fuller. But I'm talking about my recommendation was if the people that you work around, I mean, there's lots of black people named Smith and Jones and Johnson. And you work around some white people who might have those names. So you can, in this day where everybody's looking up their ancestry and all like that, you can say, hey, we might have something in common. And, you know, uh, Mr. Bruce Johnson, I mean, you know, the, over there on the other machine, I mean, that you're working on next to him in the factory and whatnot, say, well, my name is Alvin Johnson, and uh, your name is Bruce Johnson. Uh, you think we might have something in common, uh, Bruce, if you're on a first-name basis with him, you know? And say, well, hey, we got something in common now. we got the names in common. I mean, your name is the same as mine. We might have a little ancestral connection there. Uh, your father might have owned my father or grandfather or great, 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 great something. And uh, so, uh, you know, you, you might can give me a little help, you know? One ancestor to another, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, and you can you, you can just start down that road. I mean, after all, what is looking up ancestors supposed to be for? Yeah, starting with back with uh, Alex Haley and Roots. A lot of people said, you know, and and there are whole groups now and whole organizations set up. Well. Let's try 
trace ancestry. Let's let's look into it now. Here's, you know, I think I had a cousin named Bob. I mean, you know, and uh, uh, Uncle Uncle Jeff. I mean, it goes back here and goes back there by way of Carolina, by way of New Orleans, and all the way back to the west coast of Africa. Uh, you know, and people are painstakingly doing this. Mm-hmm. But it comes down to what for? Say, well, I mean, you know, it's good to know where you came from and all like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, but what for? Mm-hmm. What are you going to do with it when you get it? Hmm. So you got all that information. Does... Information is supposed to do something to help you do something. Yes. Otherwise, why have it? Yes. See, we're in desperate situations now. We just don't go around just leisurely like we are in what you call the emperor class of the old days, ancient Rome and whatnot, just doing stuff just to be doing it. Mm-hmm. Does we it, can't afford that luxury. Does it bother you, or could does it bother you, that uh, looking at your family tree, that your last name, Fuller, may not really be your last name? Uh, being that if you accept that your, your your ancestors, which you may or may not know, came from, as you just mentioned, the west coast of Africa, which I don't think Johnson and Fuller or or Thompson what were last names uh, uh, to the indigenous people of that land. Does it bother you that Fuller may not be or you may not know what your uh, last name is, if there is such a thing as a last name? Oh, no, names don't bother me. It's what, it's what happens that bothers me, and that is, how did I get the name that I got? Okay. I mean, what my original name was really doesn't matter to me. I want to know what happened to me and and who did it. And so all roads lead to the white supremacists. That's all of them. And all the names, the names that I don't have, you know, the name Fuller, I mean, that's a name that was given to me, and they brag about it by slave masters. So I say, hey. That's where the trail runs out, as far as I'm concerned. I don't need to know nothing else. Yes. So that's what I'm dealing with. Yes. And I don't need to find out what my original name was. I can find that out at leisure after I get everything straightened out with the people who gave me the name Fuller. Yes. That's where the business is. Yes. To get that straight. Yeah. I think so a lot what of... What am I doing wearing this name? Right. And it looks like somebody needs to compensate me. For some kind of dislocation here. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's a good. That's a strong term there. Compensate. And our topic today is open phone, which means that you may call in and ask Mr. Fuller uh, any question, and he will uh, answer your question. And I, I need for you to keep in mind that uh, the 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 answers will be in a compensatory counter racist logic form. And that's very important that you stay focused on that. Uh, let's go to the phone lines right now. Caller, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Oh, hi. My name is Gregory. I'm calling from Florida. And um, I just wanted to get Mr. Fuller's opinion on the uh, politician from Virginia who had the uh, black face in the Klan photo and who said he was in it and then said he wasn't in it. I thought about how Mr. Fuller says they go back and forth on things and play both sides. And I'm just curious to know what he thought about that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fuller? Just to be expected. We're in a system of white supremacy. So the code, according to the code, any white person who is able to be a racist probably is one. Now, that's a flat statement, but I stick by it. Because somebody has to be a white supremacist. And that somebody is not just a handful of... Uh, say, two or three station wagons full of good old boys out on a beer drinking spree and uh, yelling at black people the N-word from some cars going down the street. Now, usually black people think of that as there goes some white supremacists. They got uh, Confederate flags all over their, the hood of their vehicles, and they got Nazis, swastikas, uh, flags flying from the, the buffer uh, and all that type of thing, and they're yelling N-word here and N-word there at every black person that they see while they're swigging beer. Now, that's the image that a lot of black people have in mind when they think of white supremacists. But the white supremacists are people that you're looking at every day. Mm-hmm. The people 
people you sit next to on the bus, the people that you pass on the street, and say good morning to, and they say good morning very pleasant to you, pleasantly to you. See, they are born in a system of white supremacy. Yes. A white person is born in a system that's already in place. There's no other government on the planet. Correct. There shouldn't be. No one should go into the Captain Renault uh, making a correlation here to the movie Casablanca. I'm shocked, shocked to find that there's racism going on here. You know, <laughs> well, uh, the captain in the movie was talking about gambling in a particular place that everybody knew was a gambling place. All right. But all of a sudden, because he wanted to shut the place down, and he was the captain of the police services, he said he's shocked, shocked to find that there's gambling going on here, even though he was one of the gamblers. <laughs> yeah. so it's the same with the white supremacists. They mm -hmm. turn on each other every now and then, mm -hmm. and they'll say, I'm shocked, shocked to find that there's racism in Virginia. Mm -hmm. All right. And that, you know, that the governor did some racist things. Well, now, if we're going to pick out every white person and get them, try to get them to tell the truth, one of the questions in the code book, have you ever used the N-word, all right, or something of that type, something of that nature? Have you ever, in any context, used the N-word? Have you ever referred to black people uh, according to the N-word? Yes or no? Yes or no. Now, how many white people, you know, do you think, this off the top of your head, everybody in the audience, in the Northwestern Hemisphere, do you think that they would cover quite a few white people? Hmm. That it, and suppose you had heard each and every one of them use the N-word. Hmm. Now what are we going to do? Because <laughs> you're talking about every school teacher, every mm -hmm. bus driver, every person in the employment office, all the people that you're around you, that you work with every day, mm. they have never used the N-word. Never, ever. Mm. Even going back to elementary school, never. All of these white people now, you know. Mm. And if you had, you know, if every black person could have heard every white person who ever used the N-word, and then that white person was going to be sent to jail for using it or lose their job for losing it. Now what? That means you would have a whole bunch of white people <laughs> who would not have jobs. Yeah. Uh, I, I can just about guess that. I mean, no white person would have a job anywhere. Uh. Okay? <laughs> just, just about. I mean, because most white people, I think, have used that word mm -hmm. maybe just one time mm -hmm. in their entire existence, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, in a discussion or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so in answer to the question, uh, that's to be expected. Yes, yes, sir. And black people of all people should say, hey, you know, that's <laughs> routine. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, I mean... Hey, you know, uh, and, and making what you call using the N-word and what uh, white people when they're joking. Uh, when I was in the military and the Army, I mean, uh, sometimes white guys would start telling jokes and they'd stop. And then over a period of time, they just stopped trying because every joke that they knew was about black people. Mm. Everyone, and they had to realize that, being around me, I mean, they'll start telling the joke, well, let me tell you this joke, Bull, and all of a sudden they'll stop. And after about five or six times, the person who was doing the talking would realize, I don't know any jokes mm -hmm. other than jokes about black people, you know, what they call N-word jokes, you know, so they just stopped trying to tell jokes at all. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's do this. Okay, let's go to the phone call. Call on line number one. Uh, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Yeah, hello, Mr. Fuller, Mr. Bobby. Um, my great-grandfather was, uh, his mother was Cherokee, and he was telling me they made him put down the bowl and pick up the plow. They wanted to assimilate. Uh, and then this whole genetic 
thing is to get us to stay that we come from Africa. A lot of us were slaves from Africa, but a lot of us were slaves here. They didn't enslave the so-called Indians here. Is that some kind of um, white racist uh, motive to get us to believe that we all originated from Africa? And I got people telling me that they were slaves here and they were Cherokee. Mr. Fuller? Oh, you mean the uh, Cherokee Indians who had African slaves? No, no. Uh, she was Cherokee. Uh, and her husband was uh, a Negro. But she was just as dark as he was. Oh, you, what you call I mean, well, a, lot of, a lot of the tribes, uh, Indian tribes, were uh, were black people. Yes, just like in India, right. Right. you find right. you know your people. Uh, you know, in India, you have people of all shades of color. You have people of all shades of color all over the world. So, among a right. lot of the Indian a, tribes, I mean, they, a lot of them right. had very straight hair. I mean, that straight black hair, what you call Indian right. hair. Okay, but their skin was black, okay? Right. And there's a lot of a lot of that, I mean, all over the place. Black people are all over this planet. Mm-hmm. All over the Pacific Islands and everywhere. They have black people. You find black people everywhere. That's right. You know, everywhere on the planet. So that that's not, you know, that's, that's, that's the way that is. But the white supremacists, wherever they found people of color, they immediately start doing what white supremacists do. And that is conquer, kill, deceive, take, misuse, abuse, the whole nine yards. Yes. So there's people of color all over the world and the different shades of color all over the world, including in what we call uh, areas of the world that we call Asia. There are people who are just, hey, black, like they, you know, or dark brown, like you would find in Central Africa. Yes. Daryl and Glenda. Everywhere. Yeah, Daryl and Glenda, I'm trying to get to your uh, questions, but we uh, are always told that the phone calls come first. Anyway, let's do this. TalkTimeAtRadio.com. We go where you go. Download the TalkTimeAtRadio.com app to your cellar, to your tablet. That is radio the way it should be heard. Now, my name is Mr. Bobby. I am the co-host on The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Nelly Fuller. And right now is the time that we designate Mr. Fuller to discuss this fabulous book, this fabulous book that he's going to uh, uh, talk about. Those of you who are on YouTube can see me holding this book up. Um, Yeah, this is the book that he's going to talk about, and uh, you're going to need this book. Mr. Fuller, go ahead, please. Well, the book has a long, basic title, uh, The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. Uh, for years, I mean, I thought about shortening that title and whatnot, uh, even when I wrote the book. But I decided, hey, I'm going to keep that title because I'll explain the title in the book. But then I gave it supplementary titles, hoping that maybe somebody will get an idea of what the book is about, because the United Independent Compensatory Code System concept, if I saw that on a shelf myself, I wouldn't think about buying that book at all. I mean, because (laughs) the title would be alien to me. So I put other titles on the front of the book. A Compensatory Counter-Racist Code. Now, that might catch a person's eye. Mm -hmm. And then down at the bottom, I have a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism. And then I have in parenthesis, racism being white supremacy. Now, that's explicit. And the revised expanded edition of the book, because that's up from the 1984 edition, which is also on the website, producejustice.com. Some people said they wanted that. But in 2016, I revised and expanded the original 1984 edition. So a lot more material in it that covers the material that's in the 1984 edition, but a lot of additional material there. Uh, And you can get the book by going to producejustice.com. 
And there's also an additional volume, since I couldn't get everything in one volume, called A Compensatory Counter-Racist Codified Word Guide. It's about how to use words, how not to use words, not all words, because the English language consists of a uh, huge number of words. You would, you would need a cart to carry around a comprehensive dictionary. You would need something on wheels, like I have seen some English dictionaries, English language dictionaries on wheels, uh, because the language has a lot of words in it. But I've just picked out a sampling, just a small, very small sampling of words and put them in a word guide that I think that people, you can get an idea about how to use words, including words that are not even in the book. You get, you start training your mind to start asking about words when people use them. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the damage that the white supremacists do every day to people is through what they say on paper and what they say verbally. And it, it causes confusion. So that's an additional volume to the basic volume. But you can get both volumes and even get the original volume by going to producejustice.com. And the book is designed to help the individual person, the individual person, each and every day, wherever you happen to be. If you're classified as non-white, being a victim of white supremacy, and you perceive yourself to be a victim of white supremacy, the book is for you. If you don't perceive yourself to be subject to the system of white supremacy, then the book is not for you. But if you're having problems with racism, the book should be able to help you do something or start you to thinking in a certain way and speaking in a certain way on a day-to-day -day basis, wherever you happen to be, if you speak the English language. Okay. Go to ProduceJustice.com. All righty, ProduceJustice.com. Daryl, Glenda, and Kevin, I got your Gmails, but uh, we have to do the phone calls first, so I'm told. So hang in there. I'm going to try to get to them. What line am I on? Line number one? Okay. Line number one, you're on with Mr. Fuller. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Bobby. Mr. Fuller, uh, is there an echo on your end? There's no echo here. I don't hear an echo. No. Okay. You can hear me. Okay. It's echo on my end, but I'll, I'll continue. Uh, Mr. Fuller, um, your uh, book, and you suggest that we live in a global system of white supremacy uh, where we are prisoners, and we are not men and women in this system. We are children because we depend solely on, you know, our needs are dependent solely on the white supremacy. And I get that concept. Uh, my question to you is, uh, if a white person asks me directly, Sir, are you a man? Do you consider yourself to be a man? Um, what is the codified response? Is it, should I respond? Am I, uh, yes, no, I'm not. I'm a child. Um, please clarify that for me. That's exactly what I would say if I was asked that question. Well, yes, well, let me, that's let me exactly ask, what I would uh, say. If that's the response. And that's what I have in the textbook that, because I say that's the truth. I'm in a childlike state. So therefore, I'm a child, you know. In order to be a man, you manage. I'm being managed. I'm a slave. Slavery didn't end. Anytime you're subject to an unjust system, you are, by definition, a slave. And there is one government on the planet for, non, for black people, for non-white people, and that is the system of white supremacy, according to what I have written. Now, I haven't found any evidence that contradicts that. None. Even when I went looking for evidence, because I didn't want to believe that for many years. And traveling and listening to people and looking at people and looking at everything going on around me, I said, this is an entire system. And I came to that conclusion. I've seen nothing to contradict that yet. Not one thing that contradicts that. And if anybody can see a contradiction, say, well... I know some black people who are not subject to white supremacy at all. No white person from anywhere can come among these people 
mm-hmm. and tell them what to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, they they are, they they ain't got no power over them. They can't destroy them. They just have to deal with them. They do what they want to do. They don't have to answer to anybody white. I have never even heard of no such place, except just recently somebody said there was some island where that was true. But I said, my question was, can the white supremacists kill them if they want to? Can they drop a bomb on them and they don't even know what hit them? And if the answer is yes, then they're subject to the system of white supremacy. Uh, that finishes that. Yes, sir. That conversation is over in two minutes. Um, the, the caller indicated if someone, I believe the caller said that if someone asked him, are you a man, is the correct counter-racist codified response, would it be of something like this, in the system of racism, white supremacy, I am considered a, a, a child? Yes, and I am a child. Yeah, I yeah. function as a child. I'm just talking about the correct re- response in the yes, system. Of. In other words, well, if I was just going to give a flat answer in one word, it would be yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then we go from there. And I would explain to them if they want an explanation. See, I'm not qualified to be a man. I'm a prisoner of war. In the system of white supremacy racism. Well, that's what I would say. Uh, you know, first I would just say yes. Now, if they wanted to know why am I saying that, then I would tell them. But they didn't ask me that. They just asked me, am I a man? The man says no. Because I'm not qualified to be a man. Okay. Uh, okay, right there, right there. You're not qualified to be a man, but is that qualification contingent on in the system of racism, which is white supremacy? Yes, but okay. I, I have already assumed that. That's you have why, assumed that. I said I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a man mm-hmm. because it's impossible in the to system. be a man and be subject to the system of white supremacy. Okay, okay. That's where you put it. Yes, sir, yes. okay. Or, or a woman. Black females are females, but they are not women. I don't care if they get to be governors of states and mayors of cities and all like that, and males too, black males. I mean, I don't care what kind of title they got. They're subject to the system of white supremacy. And anything that they do with those positions, they got to get permission from the white supremacists to do it. They have no power. There's no such thing as a black person with power on this planet. We're all prisoners of war. Hmm. That's what the system of white supremacy means. There's no place to go where you're not subject to the dictates of white people who believe in white supremacy. That's not saying that all white people are white supremacists, but those who are the smartest and those who are the most powerful are. Otherwise, white supremacy would not exist. The white people who don't believe in white supremacy, if they were the most powerful people on the planet, white supremacy mathematically would not and could not exist. Hmm. That's the equation. Ooh, that's, hmm. That, that is a, that, well, okay, that's then, the truth. Y- okay, okay, okay. I mean, you know, but when you break it down, if the white people of this planet called Earth who don't believe in racism were more powerful than the white people who do believe in racism, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Why? Because the white people who don't believe in white supremacy would have put those white people who do believe in white supremacy in their place. Okay. Oh, yeah, they would have the muscle, all right? But they don't have the muscle. Okay. Would that indicate that justice was being practiced then? No, because just because you don't have white supremacy doesn't say that you automatically have justice. Because, see, justice just means what? Somebody's being mistreated for whatever reason. And as long as somebody's being mistreated, you don't have justice. There's no such thing as somebody being mistreated and you have a just situation. That's impossible. But according to your example, if the people who who were not white people who were not racist 
had more power than those who were, then uh, what would that be? I mean, just some type you of... You would have people who are black, brown, red, yellow. You would just have people. Yeah. Male, female. But that doesn't say that you would have justice automatically, that nobody's being mistreated. See, but as long as you have white supremacy, it's a guarantee that everybody of color is mm-hmm. being mistreated. Okay. See, yeah. if you get rid of white supremacy, you have to replace it. Yes, with something. Okay, got to leave it system. there so we can go to the second hour. Right. Okay, we'll pick that back up. Talk to him at radio.com, the world's greatest radio. That is radio the way it should be heard. Thank you for listening to the first hour. Stay tuned for the second hour here on Talk to him at radio.com. Thanks for listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. The most important question in all racial matters is why one should always ask it. Radio, the way it should be heard. You've got the power. The world's greatest radio. TalkTainmentRadio.com. Talktainment Radio Worldwide Sound. Talktainmentradio.com. We give you a reason to come. The world's greatest radio. We give you a reason to stay. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guest and not necessarily those of Talktainmentradio.com, the management, the staff, or KE World Network, LLC. Live call-in talk show. Dial 1-877-932-9766 and join the conversation here on TalkTamerRadio.com. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTamerRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio, the way it should be heard. And now... Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Only confuse you. Only confuse you. All righty. Talk to him at radio.com. We go where you go. The world's greatest radio. That is talk to him at radio.com. And you are now in touch with the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. And this is Radio the Way It Should Be Heard. If you'd like to get in contact with this show, all you have to do is call 1-877-932-9766. Or you can Gmail me. Now listen, if you do Gmail me, I I will get to it if I can. It would be better if you called and got got your call right on in there because right now I do have at least three waiting, Daryl, Glenda, and Kevin. I am efforting to get to your questions, but uh, we have to answer the, the phones first, so I am told, because, you know, when the donate hour comes, we have to pay for that phone call, so we got to... We got to get those. But anyway, our topic is open phone, if that's going to be a topic. And uh, have Mr. Fuller uh, answer your your questions or, or whatever it is that you would like to answer. Mr. Fuller, continuing on the uh, second hour, or rather uh, the first hour at the end of it, and you were mentioning and you brought up an example. If not, if rather, if white people who did not believe in racism were in charge to overtake those racist people, that we still would not have uh, a, a justice? No, yeah, because, uh, see, that's, to say that is to say that if racism had never existed, then we'd have a world in which there was no mistreatment. Well, there's no reason to believe that's true. If racism didn't always exist, presumably. So what kind of world did you have before racism existed? Did you have a world of justice where nobody was being mistreated? And there's no record that shows that. Uh, and, and there's no reason to believe that, logically. Okay. I mean, somebody was being mistreated. And what we want is a world in which nobody is mistreated. That's a tall order. That's a tall order. But while we're getting rid of racism, we have to keep in mind there's a reason why we're getting rid of racism. Racism is about 
domination and mistreatment based on color. But dominating and mistreating anybody based on anything should be gotten rid of. Okay. You don't dominate and mistreat anyone at any time. For, not, yeah. for five minutes of every, any day, mm-hmm. anywhere on this planet. It's not supposed to exist. Mistreatment of people is not supposed to exist in any form, whether it's based on color or whether it's based on anything. Uh, So-called capitalism, communism, socialism, uh, whatever kind of republicanism, (laughs) uh, democracy. Yes, sir. Is anybody being mistreated? That's the question. Anybody, regardless of who the person is and where the person is and, and how much education the person has or how much money. Is anybody being mistreated here? Now, if somebody's being mistreated, stop the clock right there because nobody is supposed to be mistreated. Find out who that person is that's being mistreated and stop that mistreatment. That should be the kind of world that black people walk around with in their heads every day, myself included. (laughs) We want a world in which there's no mistreatment of anybody, not for five minutes. And if anybody's being mistreated, Everybody's supposed to pay attention to it and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't do nothing until this mistreatment is taken care of. Yes. And in addition to it, it's another part of getting justice. Is everybody getting the help that they need, the most constructive help? Yes. And that's got to, the answer to that has got to be yes, otherwise... We stop the clock right there. We stop the clock, yes. Sir. Yeah, somebody, somebody's not getting the help that they need. The person that needs help the most is not getting it. No, 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 no. That's completely unacceptable. Hmm. No, no excuses. All right. Everybody's supposed to get help. Everybody, okay. Right. Uh, let's go to line one. Line one? Okay, yeah, line one, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Hi, Dr. Fuller. Um, hi, Mr. Bobby. Um, before I want to go to my question, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Fuller for the tremendous work. And I think uh, the com- United Compensatory Code, Counter Racist Code, is what black people need to get out of racism. Um, Dr. Fuller, my question is um, about economic empowerment on black people because um, what I've noticed is that black people specifically don't have economic opportunities in the United States. So um, poverty is one of the greatest uh, tools used against us for uh, our mistreatment and for black incarceration. So I would like my question is, what can black people really do to provide more economic opportunities so that black people can get off the street? Because most, uh, most black youth really want to work, but they don't have economic opportunities. So um, uh, what can we really do to provide uh, jobs for our young youth and for our black people that are coming out of prison with no, uh, with no jobs available for them to do? So um, I think uh, if we can tackle that problem, it's going to play a huge role in black improvement in the United States of America. Oh, okay. Mr. Ford? Well, I understand the question. Uh, I heard uh, President Donald Trump last night talking about supporting capitalism. Okay, now in the textbook for victims of white supremacy that I wrote, I say it's three ways that I know of, unless, you know, and I'd like for somebody to tell me other ways, if there's a fourth or fifth way. It's just three ways to be a capitalist. You invent something or produce something. You produce something or invent something, whichever words you choose, that people want or need. That's one way to get capital. Okay. You go in your garage or go in your basement or go to your dining room table or your kitchenette table if you're in a small apartment, and you try to come up, you get in your computer or you get a piece of paper and a pencil, and you write down and try to come up with some ideas for something that people want or need. And then you go out and try to produce that something. That's an invention. Now, very few people invent anything. 
Very few people. We call them inventors. Very few people come up with what you might call scientific breakthroughs, where they come up with something completely new, something nobody expected. And it's got to be something that people want. It may be, you know, not, not of much value, but it's people want it. Uh, like alcohol, you know, a new type of whiskey and whatnot. So you avoid doing any of that. But uh, you try to come up with a constructive invention that people want or need. Now, that's the smallest group of people on this planet that can come up with that. Mm -hmm. They're a very small group of inventors. Very few people have the type of mind who can invent something. Now, what's the next category and the biggest category of raising capital? Robbing and stealing. Now, you have to stop and think about that. But if you start talking about the people who raise capital on this planet, going all the way back, you can use the Roman Empire and the Grecian Empire as examples. What did they do in order to gain capital? Most of them were known as what? Julius Caesar and whatnot. What was he known for? Conquering. Okay, that's robbing and stealing. Christopher Columbus. How did he get all the capital that he got? Robbing and stealing. Oh, yes, he had a little seed capital. I'm just giving this as an example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Second ca category. <laughs> Christopher Columbus had an idea, according to the history book that I've read, and according to some teachers, he had an idea that he wanted to sail across an ocean and find new lands. Is that Okay, according to what I've heard, that's correct. But he didn't have any capital for doing so. So he went to a king and a queen named Ferdinand and Isabel. Now, he said, you all have capital. I don't have any. You got some money, and I'd like for you to finance me a few ships to go across a vast ocean and see if I can find something over there. Because I believe the world is round. That's what I've been told. And Ferdinand and Isabella said, okay, we got capital. But now while I'm saying that now, Christopher Columbus, watch this. He's asking somebody who has capital. So a question comes up now. The people that he asked for capital, Ferdinand and Isabella, how did they get capital? robbing and stealing. That's, how, that's what I found in the history books. Most kings and queens rob and steal. Most of them. King Leopold, I mean, well, that please, name the list of kings please. all down through history. Yes, yes. Robbing and stealing. That's how they got what they got, so they can set up in those fancy castles. Mm -hmm. So Christopher Columbus went to someone who already had capital, but the people that he got it from had a record of robbing and stealing. Okay. What did you say was the first one? The first one is inventing something. Oh, inventing, okay. Oh, yeah, that, this is nice. I mean, somebody invents something that people want or need, invent a motor car, you know? Somebody invents an airplane. Oh, you need an airplane to fly over the mountains rather than try to climb them. Okay. You know, mountain after mountain to get somewhere. And a motor car, you, you know? And lots of things have been invented. Okay, one in communications, right? One in the second category, and I have this outlined in the book. Okay, right. Is robbing and stealing. Okay, what's number three? And number three is begging. Okay. Begging what? Like Christopher Columbus did? He begged. He begged. That's what he did. What's the difference between begging and asking? Begging is asking twice. Most people, when they want a loan, they're actually begging. That's what Christopher Columbus wanted. He wanted a loan. He said, I'm going to pay you all back if I can find something to pay you back. But now when Christopher Columbus got to the other side of the water and found some people, what did he do to raise capital? <laughs> Rob and stole. Yeah. See, that's, see, this is something they don't teach in school. And... Well, I understand why. But, you know, if we're going to be capitalists, and this, the gentleman who just called in, that's why I'm taking
taken up this point because we are told by presidents and everybody, don't be a communist, don't be a socialist, that's a bunch of garbage. That ain't going to work. And chances are, what they're saying, they may be telling the truth. I guess, because I don't even know what socialism is or communism is. Really. Hmm. I mean, I say so in my book. Yes, sir. These are words. But if you're going to say capitalism, how do you get capital? So what I say for the average black person who has absolutely nothing, stop robbing and stealing. Don't go that route, because they'll set up the trap you on that. So I'm saying black people all over the world should stop stop any kind of, don't even, if you're on a job, don't you pick up a, a pair of pliers or anything without getting permission. Why? Because it's a poor way to get capital in the correct way in the world that we want and the type of people we want to be. Because we have a reputation for copying the white supremacists when it comes to getting capital. You know, when black people come around, look for them to start robbing and to stop stealing. Wow. we got to get rid of that reputation. Right, right. right? Because we got that from them. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that is the way to raise capital, robbing and stealing. Okay. And, you know, you can steal by lying, all right? Yes. All right? That, that You know, a whole lot of capital is raised by people lying to you. All right. I mean, you go to a bank. I mean, you know, the bank president might lie to you about how much interest you're going to pay and all this, okay? You find out that you're trapped in some type of mortgage that you signed your name to. I mean, now they're taking your house, but you didn't know that. That's robbery. Yes, sir. Okay? So, you know, but we don't want to be those type of people anymore. We already have a reputation for that. And the white supremacists definitely have a reputation for it because that's how they got everything. They invented things, okay. but they got in position to invent things by robbing Robin and stealing. Yeah. Right. All righty. TechTimeAtRadio.com is a 24-7, no-charge, worldwide broadcasting facility. We're supposed to live in on various topics such as news and lifestyle, sports, law, health, wellness, religion, and politics. Now, here's three that I'm going to share with you. Uh, Pastor O Speaks, The Kinsman, and At the Table. Now, all these shows that I just mentioned and the three that I mentioned in the first hour are, are all exclusive to Radio. Dot com And all you have to do is go to the TalkTainmentRadio.com homepage. There's a bar up there, and just hit the one that says Programs, and a list of all the programs that we have comes up, and you are eligible to select any one that you would like to hear uh, what's going on. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a 24-hour stream of different programs that are constantly on. Why don't you take a chance and tune in to some of those programs? Just go to TalkTainmentRadio.com homepage. Click on Programs for the Scheduled Times. All this is from TalkTainmentRadio.com. That is radio the way it should be heard. My name is Mr. Bobby. I am the co-host on the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr., and we are having what we call Open Phone and uh, what... That means is you you can ask Mr. Fuller any question. Keep in mind, please, that all of his answers will be in the compensatory counter racist code form. You have to understand that, or you're going to miss it. And speaking about that, call one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six. I still got you, uh, Dale. Glenda and Kevin, I still got you coming up. But right now we got to go to line one because I'm getting the finger. Line one, you're on. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. I hear you. All right. Uh, Mr. Fuller, what you was just talking about in that last segment that led into my next, my question, can you please expound and explain how the system of white supremacy is held together by words and how the white supremacists are the masters of words, and they're master deceit. Oh, well, there's all kinds of examples of that. I mean, words, uh, advertising. You know, if you're going to buy something, black people rush out to buy stuff. Black Monday in the Northwestern Hemisphere. I mean, we stand out there in the cold and whatnot. Based on what? Words. 
we're saying, hey, sell. Come in here and buy. You know, and there's reduced prices. 75% off. And 75% off of what? You know? Well, we'll find out when we get there. Let's get down there and get in line. All right? So we're going to go in there and we're going to buy. Those are all words. You were motivated by words to do that, standing in the cold. And it was words that brought you there. So the white supremacists, they understand advertising. They're the masters of advertising. They're the masters of words all over this planet. Even when they go among people of color and they can't speak the language, they'll learn to speak it. And then they'll teach their language to the people. They'll make sure of that. I saw in this morning's paper, where in the Cameroons, black people are killing each other about language that they got from the white supremacists, French and English. This morning's paper, you might find it in your local papers, in the Cameroons. It's in the Washington Post. People, black people in the Cameroon, they said piles of bodies. About what? Language. Some of them speak English and some of them speak French. Now, these are black people in Africa, and they are killing each other about whether they're going to speak French or whether they're going to speak English. And these were languages that came from white people. See, so, and what is language? Words. <clears throat> and there's a such a thing in the Northwestern Hemisphere called the magic word that black people use as a slang. It's the N word. That's a word that everybody gets upset about. I mean, it's very controversial, so much so that I have to say it on the air, the N word. I can't say the word itself. All right? Words are important. Words motivate people. I mean, uh, Malcolm X in the movie, uh, uh, Malcolm X, uh, by Spike Lee, uh, one of the scenes in the early part of the movie, Malcolm X is in a bar or something like that, and he's talking to someone, and the someone says something about his mother. And he hit him over the head with a bottle and said, don't you ever in your life say anything about my mother, all right? Because back in the 1940s, and even today it might be, but certainly I remember back in the 1940s, you could get away with saying a whole lot of things, one black person to another. But if one black person says something about a person's mother, that automatically meant a fight. It sure did. That might mean killing. All right, oh, right yeah. now, real quick. Real quick. Okay? But it was words. I mean, it didn't mean that if the person said something derogatory about a person's mother, it didn't mean that that was true. But the arrogance that you showed in saying it became a matter of life and death. It became important. It's words that are passed around a table when so-called nations go to war. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, people, you know, they have what they call declarations of war. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt made a big speech in 1941. He said that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and he's asking the Congress, he was using words, to retaliate by declaring war on the empire of Japan. Now these were words, and these words were very stirring, and got people stirred up to go to war, and they went, okay? And Winston Churchill is supposed to be a person who got inspired people to endure the bombing in World War II, based on words. He went around and he made a, a big speech saying we will fight them on the beaches, uh, if I remember some of the words correctly, say we will fight them from street to street. We will fight them from room to room and from housetop to housetop. We will never surrender. 
and the people were stirred up by these words, and they acted accordingly. Words can motivate people to do a lot of things. And one thing that black people got to get out of the habit of doing is falling for words that lead them down a path of destruction. All righty. Uh, let's see here. Daryl, Glenda, Kevin, and now Jane Lance. I, I got you, but I got to take the phone calls first, so I'm told. But I will read those uh, Gmails uh, whenever I get the chance, and I'm getting another finger. Line one. I'm going to get you about that finger, man. Line one, you're on. Go ahead with Mr. Fuller. Oh, yeah, Dr. Fuller. Uh, I was listening to a talk show, and, they, and uh, some some people were saying that uh, you got some black people who are boring gay. Because I was talking to you about all these uh, young women who are sleeping with each other, black women. And I was thinking about what you would say about that. And I was thinking Dr. Fuller would probably say that the white supremacists, they control the sexuality of all black people in America. Uh, who you date, how you going to date them, and when you going to date them. Uh, what is your comment about that? Well, even the concept of dating, which I say something black people shouldn't even buy into. That whole ritual, just as phony as it can be, that's not the way to you. People should just interact with each other normally. You don't set aside any type of orchestrated setup. I mean, you're just around people. People are gravitate toward people that they need to be with. That's the best way for it to happen. It just happens. All right? It happens. I mean, you gravitate. You don't set something up and orchestrate it with a box of chocolate and some perfume. And, I mean, and, and you date. Uh, what's a date? A date is something on a calendar. I mean, uh, you don't go by any of that. Any of these rituals that have been set up for black people is just as phony as it can be. And anything that's phony is not going to work out very well. And now the white supremacists, as far as this categories of sexuality, they know that if they control the sexuality of non-white people, that they got them in all the other areas of activity. There are nine areas of activity. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now, that just about covers everything that everybody on the planet is doing from one minute to another. They're engaging in one or more of these categories of activity. And all of these categories blend into each other. What affects uh, what happens in religion affects what happens in sex and in education and in entertainment. And what happens in the area of entertainment will affect what happens in politics or in economics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are just words or labels that just cover people and their behavior and their interactions with each other. And the white supremacists know how strong sex is. When people start getting sex urges at an early age, they at first, like most people I think, I know it was the case with me, I didn't know what was happening except my body is calling on me to do something, okay? And so the white supremacists are well aware of this. Uh, it's called sex urges. Your sexuality is, is coming, you know, that, that urge to, to do something with your sexual organs, which you're not even aware that you got sexual organs until you start getting those feelings, okay? And the white supremacist says, if we get control of black people's sexual feelings and try to catch them as early as possible, or propagandize through the use, like the call in said, of words. Start saying, hey, it's not just male with female. I mean, that's basic. That's, that's what you call straight uh, in a slang term. It's not even listed as a category now. When you see LGBTQ, uh, if you're going to have all the categories so far, and there will be more, you should have S in front of those. Because that's the basic category, male with female. But that's not even listed anymore. See what the white supremacists are doing? Mm -hmm. They're not even listing straight. 
but that is a slang term, like gay is a slang term. I mean, you know, gay used to mean happy, all right? Now it might mean anything, okay? So the white supremacists are systematically all over the world taking control of black people's sexuality so that in a few generations, they won't have to control black people in any other thing because just through sexuality alone. Got to leave it there, Mr. Fuller, right there. You're calling me for a station breaker. I am Mr. Bobby, the co-host on the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. And our topic today is open phone, where Mr. Fuller is answering or uh, your questions with suggestions. And don't forget that his answers will be in the compensatory counter-racist code. Now, you need to get this book that he's going to talk about in a few minutes or a quarter till the hour to understand what he's talking about. Not only get the book, but read the book and understand what's going on. one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six. This is why I don't make promises, because I have some people who have some very good questions. Uh, Daryl, Glenda, Kevin, and Jane. And if you call in, or if you call into the Gmails, I'll have to add you on the list, because I'm not going to get to the. Uh, I'm not going to get to it unless they hung up. Did they hang up? Okay, go ahead. All right. All right. Well, guess what, Daryl? I'm going to get to your question here, which is a good question, but Mr. Fuller, I think you've already answered today, but I'm going to read it anyway. Daryl, here's your question. Uh, Mr. Fuller, two of the hottest topics trending in the black uh, black America right now are Governor Northam of Virginia and actor, and actor Liam Nelson. Both admitted to past incidents of racism 35 and 40 years ago, but black folk and the mainstream whites want them to suffer, want them to resign and apologize even more. So my question is, and I know you feel like a broken record saying this almost weekly, but just for one, just for more clarification and for other new listeners out there who don't know, question, should we continue to act out of c- constant shock and outrage when we learn that a suspected white supremacist said or did something racist in the past, or should we expect these things move on and carry on with the mission of empowering ourselves and getting on code? Excellent question, because it has to do with what do you do? Now, what's the best thing to do with any white person in a system dominated by racism? Okay? That's the government of the entire world. So nobody should be surprised at any white person who steps forward and say, you know, I'm doing something that's racist, or I'm saying something that's racist. First of all, get rid of the surprises. Just stop being surprised. Stop being shocked. Stop being hurt. And just assume what the counter racist code says. Any white person who is able to be a racist in the system of white supremacy, and that is the only government on the planet that's worthy of the name government, any white person who is able to be a racist probably is one and should be suspected of being one. I'm going to say that again. And the key word here is able. Any white person anywhere on the planet who is able to be a white supremacist probably is one, and, according to counter-racist logic, should be suspected of being one. Period. Any white person who is able, key word is able, if that white person is able to be one, that white person probably is one. Why? 
because the system of white supremacy demands that if you are classified as white, that you practice racism. So I shouldn't be surprised, nobody should be surprised at anything that a white person does that shows that he or she is a racist. Nobody. Not ever. Under any circumstance. Be surprised. Surprised. In a system, in a world government that demands that if you are white, you are supposed to be one. <laughs> That's not an option. That's not an option. Absolutely. Yes. See, so therefore you always, so what do you do? What you do is just keep doing what you're doing, and that is ask for what it, make that list of what it is you want out of whatever white person you happen to encounter. And say, these are the things that I want. And I want them for constructive purposes, and I am asking you to help me to get them. Because I don't have any other way of getting what it is that I should have in order to do constructive things. Mm -hmm. If you are non-white and you're on this planet and you're going to get anything of constructive value, either directly or indirectly, you're going to get it from the white supremacists. Okay. Why? Because if you are non-white on this planet, you are already a prisoner of war. <laughs> so you have to ask someone who fits the description of wardens and guards in that prison for whatever you get. All right. All right. Thank you, Daryl, for your question. Let's go to what line am I on here? Line number one? Okay. Line number one, quickly, you're on with Mr. Fuller. Yes, Mr. Fuller, um, Mr. Bobby. That United Independent Compensatory Code System concept, I was thinking about moving it to our justice uh, political party to start in Detroit, and we can produce justice and correctness uh, in the political party nationwide, and everybody could be United Independent Compensatory Code System concept justice party. Um, you think that'll have an effect on the destruction of white supremacy with racism, Mr. Fuller? It would if the white supremacists okay it, but they could do that without doing it. See what I mean? We have to understand we are in a system of white supremacy. And we have to. The way that I've been doing it recently, because people seem to always get that mixed up. We even use the terms like in the United States. We're talking about a world government. I mean, so it's the same everywhere, even if it doesn't look like it's the same. It's the same. There's trustees in it if we went for political party would be trustees in this uh, system. Well, see, political parties, these are just labels. We have one government. This is the one thing that's most difficult for most people to understand. It's not like it's two or three different governments. It's all one government. And in capital letters, that government has a name. The name of the world government is the system of white supremacy, and it's a prison system for all non-white people. That's what it's for. And non-white people, black, brown, red, yellow, are all prisoners of war. We are already in captivity. So therefore, it's just like prisoners. Just think about the prison system now, any prison system. Prisoners say that well, we're going to get together and form a political party. Okay. So prisoners can form a political party out there in the prison yard. They get together, and, you know, but they're going to still be doing the same thing. I don't care what they name it. They're going to be begging the warden for whatever they need. I don't care what kind of party they're in. These are just labels. The name of the, of the label that black people have is prisoner of war. Victims of white supremacy. Victims of white supremacy are prisoners of war. We are already born in captivity. They're not looking for us to be captured. They're not trying to look for us to round us up and put us in the captivity. We were born in captivity. That's why we don't even recognize it as being a prison. Because we will never knew anything else other than prison. So in answer to the question, yeah, we can form little groups, but the group is going to wind up doing the same thing. I don't care what name you use. And that's begging the white supremacists for whatever we need. But 
what I do in my books, people have said, well, well, if you look at it that way, it's hopeless because, you know, your, your, your book don't mean nothing. Why bother? That's a legitimate question. But I'm saying a prison can be dismantled from the inside if we follow the rules of dismantling a prison. Anything that people put together, and the system of white supremacy was put together by people, can be taken apart by people. But you have to know how it's put together. That's what Andy Dufresne did, didn't he? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> See, he studied the prison, everything about the prison, not just one or two things. you got to study everything about the prison. That's right. you got to study, you know, what the plumbing is, how the warden operates, definitely how the warden operates. You don't watch other prisoners like black people do. That's one thing we got to stop doing. I say this on most programs. I should say it on every program until it sinks in. Black people have a priority of just watching each other and comparing ourselves with each other in everything. Mm -hmm. You got a new pair of shoes. I mean, that you got on Black Monday. So <laughs> I got to have me a pair just like them. Or I got to have a pair that costs $400 more than the pair you got. Now... As a black person, I'm happy. I'm in heaven. <laughs> Why? Because I outdid this other black person. If we tell the truth, that's what we do. Yes. That is black culture. That is And true. we got to stop that. That is true. And start looking at the people who are running everything. Mm. Okay. Stop, fella, you, you can't learn nothing by studying a fellow prisoner. Mm -mm. All right. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. <laughs> The reason why I'm laughing is because I know somebody that bought a $1,000 pair of tennis shoes. Mm. Oh, sure. Why? <laughs> the outdo. Now, he's not trying to outdo the person that made the shoes. He's trying to outdo the other black person got, that got a pair that's cheaper. A thousand dollars? Yeah. Now, once we do that, we strut down the street just grinning. All right. We are in heaven. We are walking on a cloud. <laughs> I mean, that's what you call typical Negro thinking. Woo! Hmm. Anyway, TalkTainmentRadio.com, we go where you go. Just download the TalkTainmentRadio.com app to your cell or to your tablet. That is radio the way it should be heard. My name is Mr. Bobby. I am the co-host on the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller. And our open topic today, or our topic today, is open phone where Mr. Fuller is uh, answering your questions by suggestion and also by the Compensatory Counter-Racist Code aspect. you got to keep that in mind. But... At this time, Mr. Fuller is going to speak about that book that we all should get. I have my copy. Do you have yours? Mr. Fuller, go ahead, please. You go to ProduceJustice.com, and what will come up on the screen is a brief description of the textbook for victims of white supremacy. And in that book, I tried to address it to individual persons and what each individual person can do and answer to all the questions we've been getting on this program can do an individual person you're an individual person you're not everybody you're just one person and this thing of getting together with a whole bunch of other black people and doing this and doing that that hasn't happened and not likely to happen because we are not even geared that way and it takes too long so each the theory is if you solve the problems of each and every individual black person, whatever problem that black person has right now, right this minute, everywhere on the planet, if you solve the problem of each and every individual black person, non-white person on the planet, you automatically, mathematically, solve the problems of all of the non-white people on the planet. So that's how the book is written is supposed to help each individual person, non-white person, victim of white supremacy, solve his or her own problems using the tools that are available in the system of white supremacy. I mean, what you say and what you do, what you don't say and what you don't do in every situation and the, again, it doesn't cover everything that a person can possibly do, but it shows samples 
of things you can do and say to make your condition better, to improve your condition, to go from uh, a better situation to the best situation, ultimately. And then, by doing that, solve all the problems of the entire world after you solve your own individual problem that is to put you in pers- put you in position to solve the problems of the entire world because that's where this is has to go anyway but the book is designed to help the individual person starting from scratch starting from right where you are wherever that happens to be in the nine areas of activity what to do and what not to do because everything is about what to do and what not to do and what to say and what not to say. And the book is designed to tell, to give a guide to each individual person by what to do and what not to do, what to say and what not to say all day long, every day, in all of all problems their own problem of the entire world. Yes. Because you're in the world. Mm-hmm. Go to producejustice.com. Okay. All right. Glenda, here we go. We got you. Here, this is TalkTimitRadio.com. You're listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby, one 877 Okay, Glenda, we've got to you. She says this, Mr. Fuller. Mr. Fuller, what do you think about Black History Month and black people claiming that many major inventions are made by black people? I just saw a post by a black person claiming that a black man invented the cell phone 40 years ago. Oh, could be. Could be. But the white supremacists, see, we've got to always think about what do the white supremacists think. Not so much about what we think. And what I say is just what I just said. What do the white supremacists think? The prison wardens. The people that we're subject to, what do they think about our inventions? Well, the record shows what they think about our inventions is, hey, my Negro, my slave, invented a horseshoe for my horse. Because that's where I'm going to put it. I'm going to take that shoe and put it on my horse. Because he's my slave. Anything that he invents comes to me anyway mm-hmm. because he hasn't invented a system for me not to tell him what to do so anything that he does he can feel good about it and i want him to feel good about it so boy go back in that garage go back in that barn go back in your shack that i allowed you to have and invent something else for me to use mm-hmm. all right mm-hmm. and bring it to me as soon as you invent it and i will pat you on your head and kick you in your behind and send you back there to invent something else. Yes, that is. Now, do you understand that, Negro? All right. So black people, what does that mean to me? doesn't mean anything about what we invented. Yes. Why? Because it doesn't mean anything to the white supremacists. That's why. Yes. Because they run all of our business anyway. So us walking around bragging to each other, about what we invented in the prison yard. Well, I invented some new bar, new bars, a new, a stronger type of steel for my cell, and I showed it to the warden. He says, "Yes, I'll take this and use it." Yes. Against you mm-hmm. to make your cell even more secure, so yes. that you don't escape. Yes. You know, Mr. Fuller, um, one of my uh, in my research er- areas that I was doing this week was uh, about Eli Whitney. And I was told when I was going to school that Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. And there, there's some question of whether e- Eli Whitney was black or white. But that last statement that you just made, uh, even if he were, uh, because he was a slave owner, what I discovered that any slaves that invented anything if they were a, if they were on the plantation or a part of the uh, slave owner, let, let's say Johnson or Barnes, Mr. Johnson or Mr. Barnes got the credit for the invention and not the slave. So what you said was absolutely 
on point. Absolutely correct. Because that's what they did during that particular time. They're probably still doing that. All right, anyway, let's go to this. Uh, Kevin, we finally got to you. He says, Mr. Fuller, please ask Mr. Fuller to elaborate on the lessons from the movie High Noon. Thank you. Oh, the main lesson from Casablanca to High Noon to Bridges of Tokyo to a whole bunch of movies that I have named, uh, uh, Bound for Glory about a musician uh, named Woody Guthrie. It's about individualism. And at the same time, looking at the entire world. You are alone. That's why I wrote my book for the individual person. Always look at yourself as being alone. Black people have this herd mentality. You think that because you are on the other side of town, but a whole surrounded by a whole bunch of black people, you never see a white person, that that's some kind of security. You're just as insecure as you can possibly be. You're not secure. You're looking at fellow prisoners in a prison yard. That's how you should see them. I don't care what kind of neighborhood it is. It's just a fancy prison, that's all, in the system of white supremacy. So what I'm emphasizing is try to be powerful as an individual person. Stop thinking that you've got a whole lot of help because you don't have it. That's an illusion. All non-white people are prisoners of war. You say, well, you know, in the place where I come from, black people, you know, we got a, a chief of police is black, uh, the mayor is black, I mean, uh, most of the people that are on the board are black, on the school board and all like that. You're still in a prison cell. Folks, wake up and smell the coffee. All of you are in a prison cell. Now, that doesn't say you give up these positions because you need to learn how to run things. Because prisoners, you know, what does a prisoner know except being a prisoner? And so you learn things while you're in prison and try to learn everything that you possibly can, like End of the Frame and Shawshank Redemption. He set up a library so that he can learn more. Keep learning. Don't stop learning. You have to do that. Yes, sir. So if you're given the position of mayor or something like that, don't think that you have some power because you don't. You know, you ask us a title that you have in the prison system, okay, but you still go to your cell. Your side of town is still determined by the white supremacists. The fact that you're a mayor was determined by the white supremacists. Absolutely. They set that up. Okay. I mean, so it's always think in terms of you are alone. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. That's why these movies that I list, how to act when you're alone. Okay. Always think how to think when you're alone. Okay. All right. Now, as we come to the close of the show, uh, we're not going to answer. Ask, uh, we're not going to get a chance to get to this question, but it will be the topic of next week's program. And the question is: Is racism more important than their own survival? That's going to be the topic that we will lead off to, plus we'll clean up some other uh, situations. Mr. Fuller, in the final seconds that we have, anything else that you'd like to add uh, of today's program before the music starts? Well, I'll just, uh, just elaborate on that main note. The United Independent, that's why I call it the title of the book that I have that you can get by going to ProduceJustice.com. It's about looking at yourself as being absolutely alone on this planet. All right. As a prisoner of war. Thank and you. And act accordingly. Act accordingly. Listen Thank to everybody and try to improve, improve your condition. All right. we got to leave it there until next week. Is racism more important than their own survival? That's next week's question. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, G Mellers, all that. Talk to them at radio.com, the world's greatest radio. And radio the way it should be heard. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thanks for listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com.
the world's greatest radio. The most important question in all racial matters is why. One should always ask it. Radio, the way it should be heard. You've got the power. The world's greatest radio. TalkTainmentRadio.com.